Hey, you found us. Welcome, everybody. This is Scripture Gems. Hello, and welcome to the show. My name is John Fulmer, and this is my brother Jay. How's it going, John? We are two brothers who just can't get enough of the scriptures. That's right. We love them. This episode, we are going over the Come Follow Me lesson for March 18th through 24th, 2024. This is covering 2 Nephi chapters 31 through 33. And now, let's bring out the star of the show, the scriptures. Oh, welcome, Scriptures. So great to see you. And now let's consult the Scripturematic 6000 to find out how long it will take to read this week's reading. 13 minutes, 17 seconds. Fantastic. What would that be daily? 1 minute, 53 seconds. Oh my goodness, so easy to do. And here we've got time codes if you want to take it chapter by chapter. Otherwise, buckle up and we'll talk about them all together. Now today's readings conclude the writings of Nephi on the small plates. But with the space and time he has left, look for what he wants to write about. Right. Let's start in 2 Nephi chapter 31, starting in verse 2. Wherefore the things which I have written sufficeth me, save it be for a few words which I must speak concerning the doctrine of Christ. Wherefore I shall speak unto you plainly, according to the plainness of my prophesying. The Institute Manual includes this great quote from Elder Jeffrey R. Holland. This comes from his book, Christ and the New Covenant. Here he explained the meaning of the doctrine of Christ as used in this verse. Quote, Although a phrase like the doctrine of Christ could appropriately be used to describe any or all of the Master's teachings, nevertheless, those magnificently broad and beautiful expressions spread throughout the Book of Mormon New Testament and Latter-day Scriptures might more properly be called the doctrines of Christ. Note that the phrase Nephi used is distinctly singular. In Nephi's concluding testimony and later in the Savior's own declaration to the Nephites at his appearance to them, the emphasis is on a precise, focused, singular sense of Christ's doctrine. Specifically, that which the Prophet Joseph Smith declared to be the first principles and ordinances of the gospel. End quote. That is a really helpful clarification. So notice then what ordinance Nephi spends his time on in the coming verses. Considering that Nephi's words are written for our day, and that many Christians today deny the need for baptism. What a blessing that Nephi teaches so plainly the importance and purpose of this saving ordinance. Let's keep going in verse 4. Wherefore I would that ye should remember that I have spoken unto you concerning that prophet which the Lord showed unto me, that should baptize the Lamb of God, which should take away the sins of the world. And now if the Lamb of God, he being holy, should have need to be baptized by water to fulfill all righteousness, O oh, then, how much more need have we, being unholy, to be baptized, yea, even by water? To fulfill all righteousness, a phrase used by Jesus himself to explain why he must be baptized in Matthew 3, verse 15, means to fulfill God's requirements for eternal life. Look at John 3, 5 from the New Testament. Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. Right. Let's get back to 2 Nephi 31, going on with verse 6. And now I would ask of you, my beloved brethren, wherein the Lamb of God did fulfill all righteousness in being baptized by water. Know ye not that he was holy? But notwithstanding he being holy, he showeth unto the children of men that, according to the flesh, he humbleth himself before the Father, and witnesseth unto the Father that he would be obedient unto him in keeping his commandments. Wherefore, after he was baptized with water, the Holy Ghost descended upon him in the form of a dove. And again, it showeth unto the children of men the straightness of the path and the narrowness of the gate by which they should enter, he having set the example before them. And he said unto the children of men, Follow thou me. Wherefore, my beloved brethren, can we follow Jesus, save we shall be willing to keep the commandments of the Father? And the Father said, Repent ye, 
Repent ye and be baptized in the name of my beloved Son. And also the voice of the Son came unto me, saying, He that is baptized in my name, to him will the Father give the Holy Ghost, like unto me. Wherefore, follow me, and do the things which ye have seen me do. The Institute Manual has a quote from Elder Robert D. Hales. This is from the October 2000 General Conference. About this, he says, quote, Entering into the kingdom of God is so important that Jesus was baptized to show us the straightness of the path and the narrowness of the gate by which we should enter. Born of a mortal mother, Jesus was baptized to fulfill his father's commandment that sons and daughters of God should be baptized. He set the example for all of us to humble ourselves before our Heavenly Father. We are all welcome to come into the waters of baptism. He was baptized to witness to his Father that he would be obedient in keeping his commandments. He was baptized to show us that we should receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. As we follow the example of Jesus, we too demonstrate that we will repent and be obedient in keeping the commandments of our Father in heaven. We humble ourselves with a broken heart and a contrite spirit as we recognize our sins and seek forgiveness for our trespasses. We covenant that we are willing to take upon ourselves the name of Jesus Christ and always remember him. Close quote. Great. And Nephi goes on, verse 13. Wherefore, my beloved brethren, I know that if ye shall follow the Son with full purpose of heart, acting no hypocrisy and no deception before God, but with real intent. That means to be completely sincere in one's efforts and commitment to follow the Son of God. Going on. Repenting of your sins, witnessing unto the Father that ye are willing to take upon you the name of Christ by baptism, yea, by following your Lord and your Savior down into the water according to his word. Behold, then shall ye receive the Holy Ghost. Yea, then cometh the baptism of fire and of the Holy Ghost, and then can ye speak with the tongue of angels and shout praises unto the Holy One of Israel. That's such a great image. Now, as we find out in the next chapter, to speak with the tongue of angels is to speak the words of Jesus by the power of the Holy Ghost. And speaking of the instruction to follow the Savior with full purpose of heart, instead of hypocritical pretense, President Marion G. Romney, in an article in the October 1983 Enzyme, said, quote, There are individuals who try to serve the Lord without offending the devil. Close quote. Love that line. <laughs> That's so good. So imagine that we have a chance to explain to a friend why we believe baptism is so important. What do we learn from these verses? Here are a few highlights. Jesus Christ, though sinless, was baptized to fulfill all righteousness. Jesus Christ set the perfect example of obedience for us to follow. If we sincerely repent and follow the Savior by being baptized, then we will receive the Holy Ghost. Now, as an interesting side note, verse 15 contains words specifically from Heavenly Father, which is very unusual and special. We need to pay close attention to that. The Institute Manual tells us, On one of the rare occasions when the voice of the Father was heard, he testified, Yea, the words of my beloved are true and faithful. He that endureth to the end, the same shall be saved. He later said, that those who endure to the end shall have eternal life, as it mentions in verse 20. These sacred words that Nephi heard from the Father illustrate that one of the most significant promises of the gospel is that those who endure to the end will receive eternal life. Right. Let's keep going in Second Nephi 31, verse 17. Wherefore, do the things which I have told you, I have seen that your Lord and your Redeemer should do. For for this cause have they been shown unto me, that ye might know the gate by which ye should enter. For the gate by which ye should enter is repentance 
and baptism by water, and then cometh the remission of your sins by fire and by the Holy Ghost. And then are ye in this straight and narrow path which leads to eternal life. Yea, ye have entered in by the gate. Ye have done according to the commandments of the Father and the Son, and ye have received the Holy Ghost, which witnesses of the Father and the Son, unto the fulfilling of the promise which he hath made, that if ye entered in by the way, ye should receive. So notice the gate that we must enter to begin our path back to God. Repentance and baptism by water. Then comes the remission of sins by fire and the Holy Ghost. So take a look at this visual. I had my son make this animation for me, and although it's simple, it shows that when we pass through the gate and the waters of baptism, the Holy Ghost is a light in the dark to help us with our path. What a blessing the gift of the Holy Ghost is. The Holy Ghost witnesses of the Father and the Son and brings a remission of sins. In addition to helping us know that the Father and the Son live, the Holy Ghost helps us come to know them, their will and character, and helps us to become like them. Now, a note on the Holy Ghost and a remission of sins. The 2017 Seminary Manual has this quote from Elder Bruce R. McConkie from his book, A New Witness for the Articles of Faith. He says, quote, Sins are remitted not in the waters of baptism, as we say in speaking figuratively, but when we receive the Holy Ghost. We become clean when we actually receive the fellowship and companionship of the Holy Ghost. It is then that sin and dross and evil are burned out of our souls as though by fire. The baptism of the Holy Ghost is the baptism of fire. End quote. Love it. President Henry B. Eyring, in a BYU devotional in 1989, said, quote, When the Holy Ghost is your companion, you can have confidence that the atonement is working in your life. Not only is your feeling the influence of the Holy Ghost a sign that the atonement, the cure for sin, is working in your life, but you will also know that a preventative against sin is working. Close quote. Now, verse 18 describes the path we enter onto after the gate as straight. Now, note the spelling. It's not A-I-G-H-T, it's A-I-T. This means narrow, strict, exacting, and allowing for no deviation. So, what do we need to do to stay on that path after we are baptized? Let's go on with what Nephi teaches in verse 15. And I heard a voice from the Father saying, Yea, the words of my beloved are true and faithful. He that endureth to the end, the same shall be saved. And now, my beloved brethren, I know by this that unless a man shall endure to the end in following the example of the Son of the living God, he cannot be saved. So to endure to the end is defined by Nephi as following the example of Jesus Christ. The Institute Manual has this great quote from Elder Joseph B. Worthlin. This comes from the October 2004 General Conference. He says, quote, Enduring to the end means that we have planted our lives firmly on gospel soil, staying in the mainstream of the church, humbly serving our fellow men, living Christ-like lives, and keeping our covenants. Those who endure are balanced, consistent, humble, constantly improving, and without guile. Their testimonies are not based on worldly reasons. They are based on truth, knowledge, experience, and the Spirit." End quote. That is very encouraging. The seminary manual has this quote from Elder Dieter F. Uchtdorf. This is from the October 2007 General Conference. He says, quote, Enduring to the end is a process filling every minute of our life, every hour, every day, from sunrise to sunrise. It is accomplished through personal discipline following the commandments of God. The restored gospel of Jesus Christ is a way of life. It's not for Sunday only. It is not something we can do only as a habit or a tradition if we expect to harvest all of its promised blessings. Close quote. 
Well, let's finish out chapter 31, starting in verse 19. And now, my beloved brethren, after ye have gotten into this straight and narrow path, I would ask if all is done. Behold, I say unto you, Nay, for ye have not come thus far, save it were by the word of Christ, with unshaken faith in him, relying wholly upon the merits of him who is mighty to save. Wherefore, ye must press forward with a steadfastness in Christ, having a perfect brightness of hope, and a love of God and of all men. Wherefore, if ye shall press forward feasting upon the word of Christ, and endure to the end, behold, thus saith the Father, ye shall have eternal life. And now, behold, my beloved brethren, this is the way, and there is none other way nor name given under heaven whereby man can be saved in the kingdom of God. And now, behold, this is the doctrine of Christ, and the only and true doctrine of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, which is one God, without end. Amen. The seminary manual includes this quote from President Russell M. Nelson. This is from the Worldwide Youth Devotional in 2018. He says, quote, If you have wandered off, or if there are some things you need to let go of to help your mind and heart be more pure, today is the perfect time to change. If you aren't sure how to repent, talk with your bishop or your parents or both. They will help you understand the atonement of Jesus Christ. They will help you experience the joy that true repentance always brings. Please do not stay off the covenant path one more minute. Please come back through true repentance now. Close quote. I love that. What a great invitation. And that brings us to 2 Nephi chapter 32. Let's take a look at verse 1. And now, behold, my beloved brethren, I suppose that ye ponder somewhat in your hearts concerning that which ye should do after ye have entered in by the way. But behold, why do ye ponder these things in your hearts? Didn't Nephi just explain this in careful detail? Perhaps you can imagine why Nephi is puzzled. What might you have answered to such a question? What should we do after we have entered through the gate of repentance and baptism and received the gift of the Holy Ghost? This is what Nephi says in verse 2. Do ye not remember that I said unto you that after ye had received the Holy Ghost, ye could speak with the tongue of angels? And now, how could ye speak with the tongue of angels, save it were by the Holy Ghost? Angels speak by the power of the Holy Ghost, wherefore they speak the words of Christ. Wherefore I said unto you, Feast upon the words of Christ, for behold, the words of Christ will tell you all things what ye should do. So when we feast on the words of Christ, they will tell us all things that we should do, not just spiritual but temporal matters, everything. What do you think it means to feast on the words of Christ? How is feasting different from, say, snacking? The Seminary Manual has this great quote from Elder Takashi Wada from the April 2019 General Conference. He says, quote, When I was young, I thought that feasting was simply having a big meal with rice, sushi, and soy sauce. I now know true feasting is more than enjoying a delicious meal. It is an experience of joy, nourishment, celebration, sharing, expressing love to families and loved ones, communicating our thanksgiving to God, and building relationships while enjoying abundant, incredibly delicious food. I believe when we feast upon the words of Christ— we ought to be thinking of the same kind of experience. Feasting upon the scriptures is not just reading them. It should bring us real joy and build our relationship with the Savior. End quote. I love that imagery. I think feasting is a great word when we talk about scripture study. I'd be curious to know from our listeners if Come Follow Me has helped you to learn more about what it means to feast on the words of Christ, rather than just read the scriptures. It's made a big difference for me. 
and me. Now, President Russell M. Nelson in the October 2000 General Conference had this to say, quote, to feast means more than to taste. To feast means to savor. We savor the scriptures by studying them in a spirit of delightful discovery and faithful obedience. When we feast upon the words of Christ, they are embedded in the fleshy tables of the heart. They become an integral part of our nature. Close quote. I love that. So what are some places where we can find the words of Jesus Christ? There's the scriptures, as Elder Wada mentioned, the words of modern prophets, and the inspiration from the Holy Ghost. But that seems to teach us that we won't just be handed what we should do. We need to be anxiously engaged in learning what God wants us to do. So how do I feast? Well, there's many study methods to improve feasting on the words of Christ that may help, including praying for inspiration before your study, asking questions you have before and during study, defining words, pondering, cross-referencing, taking notes of inspired thoughts, looking for truths about Heavenly Father and the Savior, and likening the Scriptures to our own lives, like we learned about in 1 Nephi 19.23. The Institute Manual has this quote from Elder Spencer J. Condy. This comes from the April 2002 General Conference. He noted that the scriptures facilitate the companionship of the Holy Ghost when we are faced with important decisions. He says, quote, You may be facing decisions about a mission, your future career, and eventually marriage. As you read the scriptures and pray for direction, you may not actually see the answer in the form of printed words on a page, but as you read, you will receive distinct impressions and promptings, and as promised, the Holy Ghost will show unto you all things what ye should do." This is such an important principle that scriptures open the door to the receipt of revelation. I remember once being just amazed in a class where we were learning from one particular section of the scriptures, but as I listened to the responses from one of the other students, I noticed that she was having a completely different lesson than we were having. The Holy Ghost was teaching her something specific for her, but it came through our study of the scriptures. Well, let's keep going in 2 Nephi 32, starting in verse 4. Wherefore, now, after I have spoken these words, if ye cannot understand them, it will be because ye ask not, neither do ye knock. Wherefore, ye are not brought into the light, but must perish in the dark. For behold, again, I say unto you, that if ye will enter in by the way, and receive the Holy Ghost, it will show unto you all things what ye should do. Behold, this is the doctrine of Christ. And there will be no more doctrine given until after he shall manifest himself unto you in the flesh. And when he shall manifest himself unto you in the flesh, the things which he shall say unto you shall ye observe to do. And now I, Nephi, cannot say more. The Spirit stoppeth mine utterance, and I am left to mourn because of the unbelief and the wickedness and the ignorance and the stiff-neckedness of men, for they will not search knowledge." nor understand great knowledge when it is given unto them in plainness, even as plain as word can be. Again, it should not be our expectation that we be handed truth. We are given the resources. Now we must become experts in discerning truth. It is our quest as disciples of Jesus Christ, and that goes for all truth. President Russell M. Nelson, in the April 1994 General Conference, quoted Elder Bruce R. McConkie, saying, quote, Every truth found in every church in all the world we believe. The more truth we have, the greater is our joy here and now. The more truth we receive, the greater is our reward in eternity. End quote. Oh, I love how vast and encompassing that is. Truth can be found everywhere, and we believe all things that are true. 
One of my favorite quotes about this topic comes from Elder Boyd K. Packer, who tells us what we should expect as we become spiritual explorers of the scriptures. This is from the October 1983 General Conference. He said, quote, For his own reasons, the Lord provides answers, with pieces placed here and there throughout the scriptures. We are to find them. We are to earn them. In that way, sacred things are hidden from the insincere. Close quote. Well, although Nephi says he's done writing, we still have a couple more verses. Let's take a look at verse 8. And now, my beloved brethren, I perceive that ye ponder still in your hearts, and it grieveth me that I must speak concerning this thing. For if ye would hearken unto the Spirit which teacheth a man to pray, ye would know that ye must pray. For the evil spirit teacheth not a man to pray, but teacheth him that he must not pray. But behold, I say unto you, that ye must pray always, and not faint. That means don't allow yourself to weaken or give up. Going on, that ye must not perform anything unto the Lord, save in the first place ye shall pray unto the Father in the name of Christ, that he will consecrate thy performance unto thee, that thy performance may be for the welfare of thy soul. Now, to consecrate means to dedicate, to make holy, or to become righteous. You can learn about that in the Guide to the Scriptures under Consecrate. So, if we pray always, God will consecrate our performance for the welfare of our souls. We recommend a great video that the church put out testifying of the importance to pray always. It's called, I Pray When, and it would be a great video to watch in class or with family and friends. We'll link to it in the video description. So, Nephi taught his people what the gate is to get on the path back to God, repentance and baptism, and how to stay on the path or endure to the end. To stay on the path requires the words of Christ and that we must feast on them, but we must cultivate a personal relationship with God through prayer. That is how we will know truth and how we can dedicate our performance in such a way that it is for the welfare of our souls. It changes us into the divine version of ourselves. Now, can we see why Satan wants so badly for us not to pray? The Institute Manual includes this great quote from President James E. Faust. This comes from the April 2002 General Conference. He says, quote, When God placed man on the earth, prayer became the lifeline between mankind and God. Thus, in Adam's generation, men began to call upon the name of the Lord, through all generations since that time, prayer has filled a very important human need. Each of us has problems that we cannot solve and weaknesses that we cannot conquer without reaching out through prayer to a higher source of strength. That source is the God of heaven, to whom we pray in the name of Jesus Christ. As we pray, we should think of our Father in heaven as possessing all knowledge, understanding, love, and compassion, end quote. So comforting. The seminary manual has a quote from Elder David A. Bednar from the October 2008 General Conference. He gave one example of what it could mean to pray always. He says, quote, Counsel with Heavenly Father in morning prayer. During the course of the day, we keep a prayer in our heart for continued assistance and guidance. At the end of our day, we kneel again and report back to our Father. We review the events of the day and express heartfelt thanks for the blessings and the help we received. We repent and, with the assistance of the Spirit of the Lord, identify ways we can do and become better tomorrow. Thus, our evening prayer builds upon and is a continuation of our morning prayer, and our evening prayer also is a preparation for meaningful morning prayer. Close quote. Nice. And that brings us to 2 Nephi chapter 33. This chapter contains the final words of Nephi's testimony, starting in verse 1. And now I, Nephi, cannot write all the things which were taught among my people, neither am I mighty in writing like unto speaking. 
For when a man speaketh by the power of the Holy Ghost, the power of the Holy Ghost carrieth it unto the hearts of the children of men. What an interesting detail. The Holy Ghost carries divine truths unto our hearts. In other words, the Holy Ghost provides an opportunity for us to receive a spiritual witness and testimony of the truth that is taught. In the next verse, look for one reason a person might not feel the Holy Ghost teaching or testifying of truth. In verse 2, But behold, there are many that harden their hearts against the Holy Spirit, that it hath no place in them. Wherefore they cast many things away which are written, and esteem them as things of naught, meaning to think that they are worthless. So if we harden our hearts against the Holy Spirit, we will not understand the value of the Word of God. Yes, the Holy Spirit will carry the truth of the Word of God to our hearts, but the condition of our hearts will determine if we receive them. The Institute Manual has this quote from Elder Dallin H. Oaks. This comes from the October 1999 General Conference. He says, quote, President Hinckley stated an important corollary to the command to teach by the Spirit when he issued this challenge. We must get our teachers to speak out of their hearts rather than out of their books to communicate their love for the Lord and this precious work, and somehow it will catch fire in the hearts of those they teach. That is our objective, to have the love of God and commitment to the gospel of Jesus Christ catch fire in the hearts of those we teach. End quote. Nice. Elder David A. Bednar, in a church education system broadcast in 2006, said, quote, Please notice how the power of the Spirit carries the message unto, but not necessarily into, the heart. A teacher can explain, demonstrate, persuade, and testify, and do so with great spiritual power and effectiveness. Ultimately, however, the content of a message and the witness of the Holy Ghost penetrate into the heart only if a receiver allows them to enter." Close quote. Notice here that both of these quotes were referring to teachers and students, but this is also important in relationships like husband-wife and parents to children. The 2017 Seminary Manual includes this quote from Elder Gerald N. Lund. This comes from the April 2008 General Conference. He says, quote, The heart is a tender place. It is sensitive to many influences, both positive and negative. It can be hurt by others. It can be deadened by sin. It can be softened by love. Early in our lives, we learn to guard our hearts. It is like we erect a fence around our hearts with a gate in it. No one can enter that gate unless we allow him or her to. In some cases, the fence we erect around our hearts could be likened to a small picket fence with a welcome sign on the gate. Other hearts, have been so hurt or so deadened by sin that they have an eight-foot chain-link fence topped with razor wire around them. The gate is padlocked and has a large no trespassing sign on it. The condition of our hearts directly affects our sensitivity to spiritual things. Let us make it a part of our everyday striving to open our hearts to the Spirit. Since we are the guardians of our hearts, we can choose to do so, end quote. Nice. Well, let's keep going in chapter 33 with verse 3. But I, Nephi, have written what I have written, and I esteem it as of great worth, and especially unto my people. For I pray continually for them by day, and mine eyes water my pillow by night because of them. And I cry unto my God in faith, and I know that he will hear my cry. And I know that the Lord God will consecrate my prayers for the gain of my people. And the words which I have written in weakness will be made strong unto them. For it persuadeth them to do good. It maketh known unto them of their fathers. And it speaketh of Jesus and persuadeth them to believe in him and to endure to the end, which is life eternal. And it speaketh harshly against sin, according to the plainness of the truth 
Wherefore, no man will be angry at the words which I have written, save he shall be of the spirit of the devil. I glory in plainness. I glory in truth. I glory in my Jesus, for he hath redeemed my soul from hell. I have charity for my people, and great faith in Christ, that I shall meet many souls spotless at his judgment seat. What a great description. The Book of Mormon persuades people to do good, to believe in Jesus Christ, and to endure to the end. In verses 8 and 9, Nephi expressed the charity for the Jews and the Gentiles, and he emphasized the need for all people to be reconciled to Jesus Christ and remain faithful to him. But what if we reject the truth, the words of Christ through his holy servants? Well, let's pick it up again in verse 10. And now, my beloved brethren, and also Jew and all ye ends of the earth, hearken unto these words and believe in Christ. And if ye believe not in these words, believe in Christ. And if ye shall believe in Christ, ye will believe in these words, for they are the words of Christ. And he hath given them unto me, and they teach all men that they should do good. And if they are not the words of Christ, judge ye, for Christ will show unto you with power and great glory that they are his words at the last day. And you and I shall stand face to face before his bar, and ye shall know that I have been commanded of him to write these things, notwithstanding my weakness. And I pray the Father in the name of Christ that many of us, if not all, may be saved in his kingdom at that great and last day. And now, my beloved brethren, all those who are of the house of Israel, and all ye ends of the earth, I speak unto you as the voice of one crying from the dust. Farewell, until that great day shall come. And you that will not partake of the goodness of God, and respect the words of the Jews, and also my words, and the words which shall proceed forth out of the mouth of the Lamb of God, behold, I bid you an everlasting farewell. For these words shall condemn you at the last day. For what I seal on earth shall be brought against you at the judgment bar. For thus hath the Lord commanded me, and I must obey. Amen. Now, did you catch that word in verse 10? Hearken. That's more than just listening. That means to hear and obey the voice or teachings of the Lord. Check out your guide to the scriptures under hearken. Hearken unto these words. Believe in Jesus Christ and believe that the words Nephi recorded are the words of Christ. If we do not respect the words of the Lord and his servants, then their words will condemn us at the last day. The Institute Manual includes this quote from President Ezra Taft Benson. This is from the April 1975 General Conference. He says, quote, Our main task is to declare the gospel and do it effectively. We are not obligated to answer every objection, Every man eventually is backed up to the wall of faith, and there he must make his stand. And if they are not the words of Christ, judge ye, said Nephi, for Christ will show unto you with power and great glory that they are his words at the last day, and you and I shall stand face to face before his bar, and ye shall know that I have been commanded of him to write these things. Every man must judge for himself, knowing God will hold him accountable. Close quote. I love that Nephi closes with these words, I must obey, verse 15. As you reflect back on what we've learned about Nephi, how significant are those words in the way he lived his life? Remember Nephi leaving Jerusalem returning to Jerusalem to get the brass plates, returning to Jerusalem again to ask Ishmael's family to join them, keeping two sets of plates, following the directions on the Liahona, building a ship, journeying to the promised land, separating from Laman and Lemuel, and leading his people in righteousness. What a great example, a lived testimony for each of us. This has been so exciting to study Nephi's writings and all of the powerfully Christ-centered teachings. 
you could feel his enthusiasm and his passion and his love, not just for the Lord, but for each of us. Well, this has been really great to revisit these chapters together. Longtime listeners of the show will know that we started in 2020 with the Book of Mormon. We decided to re-record our episodes for 1 Nephi and 2 Nephi because, well, we were learning and we were trying to get our format together. We've done that now, and so to continue with your study of the Book of Mormon, please go back to our 2020 recordings. For those of you listening on the audio podcast, those are the earliest episodes, and for those on YouTube, please reference a playlist that we have for the Book of Mormon. We'll put a link to that in the description. Now, even though that was back in 2020, we were so young then, (laughs) you'll find all of the insights and quotes and graphics that you've come to expect from the show. And don't forget to make a note of gems you've discovered in this lesson and share them with family and friends. And share them with us in the comments section. And as always, keep reading your scriptures And we'll talk to you more about them in our next lesson. We'll see you then. This podcast is not officially affiliated with The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. But we're really big fans.